Well, those of you that were here, it was about a year ago at this time when we started talking about Common Core together as a group. I know you'd heard a little bit about it before. I promise that this is not a rehash presentation, and I hope that today you walk away with one or two tools that are going to be helpful in the conversations that you really have to make as agile leaders moving forward with your different constituency groups in order to make this effective for what we ultimately need to do for kids. So you're not going to hear the term Common Core a lot from me because honestly, the Common Core, as Bob and I were just talking right before this presentation started, it's really a mechanism about getting kids to be able to be at a level in which they can be productive in society. That's ultimately what our goal is. Um, one of the things, um, I was at a conference this summer, and the presenter was asking a great question to the group of educators, and he was basically saying to the group of educators, I want you to think about what you're preparing your kids for um, as you know, whatever you're doing, whether you're an elementary school teacher, a high school teacher, what are you preparing your kids for? And he called on a lot of people in the room, and the, quite honestly, the answer was, he, if he called on a third grade teacher, for the most part, the third grade teacher was going to say, I'm preparing them for fourth grade. And when he called on the middle school teacher, they would say, I'm preparing the kids for? And when he called on the high school group of teachers, what do you think they were all saying? I'm preparing them for college. But I'm going to show you some things today that make us really think about what should we really be focused on is not necessarily be, being you know, great participators in the next grade, but how are we going to become the type of learner, the type of worker that our society needs these kids to be. So we're going to talk about the changing world. We're going to start out with that. The world is changing. It's changing, changing at a pretty quick rate. And I think we're going to show some stats that show that. We're going to talk about, when we're talking about this changing world and we're talking about schools, which have not changed quite at the same rate as the world outside of them, I think we'd all agree, um, and why that might be. You know, I always joke whenever I was a principal and talking at district office or I'd be talking at board presentations, I'd say one of the toughest things about being a teacher, about being an administrator in a school system is your parents and your kids, they all think that they're experts at school because parents have all been to School, so they know what school should look like, right? But chances are, it probably shouldn't look the same way it did when they went to school. Um, and then we're going to talk about how do we take these two pieces of information, we've gotten the message out, to empower these different groups to help us with the job that we have at hand, because it's all about collaboration. We heard that this morning in Flip Classroom. You heard that as you did the different breakout sessions. The bottom line is it's all about collaboration. So let's talk about the changing world. I want us all to think for just a second, we're going to have a little moment of levity here. Um, this person, these people that we're getting ready to watch this really short video clip on, they have a really tough job. It's a very tough job. It's one that probably most of us feel like we're doing every single day as we're trying to manage all of these expectations with Common Core, the world, and uh, APPN. PM. This man right here is my great grandfather. He's the first cat herder in our family. Herding cats. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle. Holding together 10,000 half wild short hairs, well, that's another thing altogether. Being a cat herder is probably about the toughest thing I think I've ever done. I got this one this morning, right here. And if you look at his face, it's it just ripped to shreds, you know? You see the movies, you hear the stories, it's, I'm living a dream. Not everyone can do what we do. I wouldn't do nothing else. It ain't an easy job, but when you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost a one of them, ain't a feeling like it in the world. So I want you to think about if you ever feel like your job feels a little bit just like that, herding cats. Because agile leaders need the courage to face what we're going to be talking about in the next few slides. Um, I don't know if anybody has any thoughts, but I have a percentage up here. Does anybody have any ideas about what this percentage might stand for? That is a great, and it might be true, but that's not why it's up here, but that's a great one, right? I'm very, that, very impressed. That's the first time I've heard that one when we put it up here. I'm gonna give you another hint about this percentage. This percentage has actually been put up multiple times when Condoleezza Rice has been giving presentation to groups of educators. Now, you might be saying, first of all, why would Condoleezza Rice be doing a presentation to a group of educators? What would she know about education? I mean, she's an expert. She went to school, right? 
70% is actually the percentage of kids that when they're graduating from high school now are no longer eligible to make the military. Why is that? So there's five reasons you can be ineligible for the military, okay? First one, lack of a high school diploma. Um, just so you know, if you didn't know this already, and most of you in the high school probably do know this, those of you in the elementary may not have heard this yet, you can no longer be, be um, enlisted into the military as anything if you do not have a high school diploma. GED no longer works. So that's one of the reasons. Um, obesity, I think you probably, if you've been watching the news anywhere, you know obesity is big in the news. On, that's a reason. Drugs, incarceration are also two reasons. We're going to focus a little bit on this last one. Oops, sorry. Cannot pass the basic literacy test. This percentage, the 70, has been rising at the rate of 1% per year. Now, you might think if you look at these five things, well, there's probably a lot of things that come into play with this. The last one is the only thing that's changed. The kids are no longer able to enter the military because they cannot pass the test required to take it. Now, a lot of you are probably sitting in here saying, well, Emily, we're doing better things than we've done before, and we're going to talk about that. Education is improving. Don't let anybody tell you it's not. Education is improving. If you put the school improvement on a continuum and you use any of the measures in which to look at it, Education improvement is on the rise. But the requirements for life have increased at such a rate that even to get into the military, when you used to join the military and enlist, what they do? Pretty much, if you just enlisted as an on officer, I can tell you my husband was one, my father was one before him. They pretty much, it was, you had to get trained on how to use a gun, how to do this. Those jobs don't exist in the military anymore. Everything is technological. These kids have to be able to read at a pretty high rate in order to read the manuals and to go through the training practices they need to handle the equipment the military now handles. So I want you to think about if these kids aren't eligible for the military, are they, are they employable? Are there jobs out there for them? This is a slide that many of you saw last year when we were here. If you saw my presentation on Common Core last year, so we're going to go through it a little bit quickly. If you didn't, I'll be happy to share with you the last year's presentation to go through it in a little more detail. But these are the Lexile requirements for high school literature and college literature. You can see that's the band range there. Um, this was a meta-analysis, uh, meta-metric study that was done across the nation, looking at what are the requirements for these things for kids to pass and be successful. I want you to look at where high school textbooks outside of the English department fall. What do you see already? I think English teachers will tell you what's their number one thing. I teach really high. I, Hamlet, man, that's tough for those kids to read, right? It's even higher for our other areas. Now let's look at college textbooks. We'd expect that to be an increase, right? You would expect that. This one, that's what we're just talking about with that 70%. You'll notice it's a really tight band because it's really technical materials those kids are required to do in the military. But I want you to notice the discrepancy between military and high school and college. You can see why these kids aren't passing that test. They're not prepared. Personal use. So this was basically looking at, they surveyed adults across the nation and said, give us the last you know, 10 things you've been reading as an adult. It might have been bank statements. It might have been technical manuals. It might have been the newspaper, whatever it was. And that was the Lexile ban for personal use. How many of you have a high school student or a college student at home that you're a parent of? How many of you want that person to be an independent person? <laughs> how many, how, I'm going to show you some scary statistics that say, you know, they talk about Generation X and how they don't want to leave home and all that stuff. They may not be all prepared to. And that may be part of what we're looking at here. These are entry level occupations. And here's SAT and ACT. Wouldn't expect to see that, would you? You expect that to be a little bit higher than everything else that's supposed to be our bar. So, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the good news is we're improving. So don't let anybody tell you, no matter what you read in the newspaper, even with the drop in the New York State assessment results, we are improving. Education is improving. The bad news is that's the changing world. <laughs> So if you see the trajectory line of how we've been improving over the past few years versus what's going on in the world, there's a gap. And that gap is in some ways getting bigger and bigger even though we're still improving. So we have to get collaborative. We have to approach this in a different way or we're never going to close this for our kids. Another statistic for you. We have a rank up here, 1 to 10. These are the top 10 majors across the United States in education, I mean from college. These are what kids are graduating with. I want to pay particular close attention to two, 
which is called general studies. Um, most of us that are my age or uh, older, when we went to school, we used to call that undeclared, and you didn't really graduate with an undeclared degree. They had so many kids that were undeclared, they made up a term. They said, you know what, we'll graduate you. You can be in general studies. <laughs> Here's the scary thing. What you see over here, the number to the left of the, or to the right of each of these, is in the industrialized nations besides the United States, that's where those majors rank. So business is the number one in industrialized nations in here. Not a big surprise. But I want you to start looking at some of these things because we're going to talk about some stuff here in a minute. But look at engineering and technology. Number eight in the United States. Number two in other industrialized nations. Computer and information science. Okay, why is this important? What you major in does matter. We need to start talking to our kids about this. You can be passionate in a lot of things, but the ultimate thing is, do you really, if you're one of those parents again, raise your hand, you got a high school or college student, do you really want them to graduate with a, the average college tuition bill when kids graduate right now, their loan debt is $25,000. And I would say that that's pretty low because I can give you some scary statistics on how much tuition has increased versus everything else. And those of you that are getting close to that age, I'm with you and we've been tracking it, it's, it's getting painful. I don't really want either one of my kids, my junior in high school, I don't want her graduating with a $25,000 college bill and no ability to get a position. So we have to start talking about this. Your major does matter. Here's the STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. Here's the graduates. That's the percentage from the United States. There's a couple of others. This was a stat. It's actually a little bit old. I'll be very honest with you. This was from June, so I just want to be clear, OK? But I don't think we'd see a great difference. 13 million Americans were unemployed in June. But 3.8 million jobs in the United States remain unfilled. And those positions are not low-level positions. These are engineers. These are science math majors. These are computer specialists that we can't, we don't have, they're, they're not out there. The people aren't there to be hired. So what do we do about this? It's a problem for everybody. Forget educators. Do you think the business community is worried about this? Here's one. This was done from a, a bunch of stats from the ACT. ACT did a bunch of stats, tracked all the kids that took ACT. I think there was something like, Dominic will probably remember the number for me, 2 million kids. Of the 2 million kids in the study, 31% needed remediation going into college from high school. So all those high school teachers were preparing for college. 31% needed remediation in reading, writing, science, and math. They needed it in all four areas. Anybody got, got a guess on what percentage needed any kind of remediation in order to be successful? 75%. 53%, but back to my, my same group here, those of you who are parents, 53% of bachelor's degrees holder under 25 are jobless or underemployed. Meaning what they graduated to do, they are doing a job that is way below what the requirements are. They may have a college degree and they have a job that you don't even need a college degree in order to take. 37% of employed four-year college graduates are in jobs that require less than a high school diploma. Once again, we have to start having these conversations as groups of educators. We have to start talking about this. This is a very important thing for our communities. Bottom line is, whatever today's ceiling is, is going to be tomorrow's floor. And we're starting to really feel that. I mean, I know all of the teachers are feeling the pressure of Common Core. I know you as the educators that are in charge, the administrators, I know you're feeling the pains of this. But we have to start collaborating and getting creative on how we do this. And some of the things that hopefully we've talked about today are ways for you to start thinking about that. There's never going to be one answer, but we can start collaborating and start getting creative and start thinking about things like flipped classrooms and ways to make things relevant for our kids. We can get there. I do believe that. Everybody wants schools to be better. If you did a poll and said, okay, how many of you want your school to be better than it is right now? Raise your hand if you want your school to be better than it is right now. Anybody not feel that way? Nobody wants them to be different. <laughs> how many of you ever go to your uh, teacher's union group or an administrative group and you say to them, you know what, I've got this great idea. It's going to be fantastic. You know what we could do? We could increase... We know these kids need more time on task. They're not being successful in high school. They're not passing the regions. You know, if we offered a Saturday morning session for kids, how many people are going to go, oh, I'm, I'm all up for trying that? <laughs> Nobody wants them to be different. 
So how do we get there? How do we get from knowing all of these scary stats to coming up with an action plan? I believe very strongly you've got to start with your school board. If you are not having these conversations with your school board, every initiative you take to them, every outside of the box idea you've got, it's going to get kicked back because once again, how many school board members are, educa are educational experts? <laughs> not, not saying that you think they are. How many? <laughs> In conjunction with this, we have to start having real conversations with our faculty and staff. We have to start talking as a group, as teachers, as administrators, as you know, shared districts side by side. We have to start talking about this. We've got to include these last two constituency groups in these conversations. If you're not, you're climbing an uphill battle. I talked to one of my breakout sessions today and we were talking about trying to climb a hill that has ice on it without any kind of treading on your shoes. You're just going to keep sliding right back down. You have to get these groups on with you and you have to start communicating why this is so critical. So let's talk about the board. I, here's, I think there's some critical things you need to share with the board. First thing is you need to let them know schools aren't failing. Like, let's look at the results from the New York State assessments. Do you guys think that the kids all went away last summer and then they came back and they just got way, wow, you just went from a level four to a level two just because you're not doing as well? No, things changed. We started measuring things in a more rigorous way. It's not that we're failing, it's that we have to keep improving and we have to keep looking at that. We have to, you have to put that in the larger context of society. And I think some of the things we just talked about as a group are things we can start sharing with the board. Um, when it comes down to it, when it comes down to parents, you're going to see this again. When it comes down to students, you're going to see this again. You have to make it personal. You have to make it personal for the board. Do you think the board cares about the United States as a whole or do they care about your school community? Probably they care most about your school community. Call in business leaders in your area. Ask them to talk about what are we looking for in our kids. Have them come in and present to your board. You know, when we're looking for great hires, this is what we're looking for. We're looking for these three things. Now you can come in and say, here is how we are going to make kids become more team oriented. Be able to work collaboratively. Be able to work in a Google type setting where, you know, I have to figure out what's the best way I can come to work every day and participate in that. And last but not least, if we've got to talk about the human and the economic consequences of this. If these kids are unemployable, where are they going to be? They're going to be on state aid, right? They're going to be sitting in our communities being non-productive citizens, and that's probably not what anybody's looking for. So a few hopeful things that you could use to share with your board to get this message out. I think the slides, the opening slides we had on the changing world are potentially some starting points. I think if your board isn't aware of some of the stuff going on in the world, that might be a good place to start. Um, have any of you seen Did You Know? If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it as a watch. Do, uh, Do You Know was just updated in 2011. It's a little outdated now, but you, I'm sure they're going to be updating it any time again now. But Do You Know 3.0 is the most recent version out there. It is a great seven to eight minute video clip to be able to show to your board, and it goes through a lot of what we just talked about even to a higher degree with great graphics, and it's really fantastic. Um, the next two are things we're gonna sh I'm going to show you next in the next slides, but the job skill slides and the proficiency stats discussions. So let's look at job skill slides. So in the 1970s, this looked a little bit like those of you that have been to Anthony's system and the cutoff corners. <laughs> this is what the employment looked like in the 1970s. You had a whole bunch of jobs that were up here that required high skills, but you had a big base down here of low skills, and there was kind of some in the middle, and you know, that's when we were in the 70s, that's typically what the job market looked like. Fast forward to the 90s, what did we see? Well, we saw a shift. We saw a lot more semi-skilled jobs. We still had some high-skilled jobs up there that hadn't changed drastically, maybe increased just a little bit. Um, and then you had still your base of low-skilled jobs. 2010. I want you to think for just a minute, what do you think this is going to look like in 2020? I can't tell you how many jobs used to be out there when I graduated that I could have taken that aren't even in existence anymore. And there are so many positions out there that when my son graduates, he's in seventh grade right now, when he graduates from college, don't even exist right now. If they don't exist, how do we as educators prepare them for it? Well, we have to get them ready for the skills that are necessary, and we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. So 
So this is a great one to share with the board because I think this plays into the whole, why did the scores drop so much? So this was uh, two years ago. The NAEP scores are basically um, calculated. They look at the rigor level of the assessment that was given in the state, and they also look at the percentage cut for proficiency to get there. And then they give it a number of ranking. Now, according to NAPE, to be proficient, you should really be at a, like right under a 240 there. I guess that's about a 238. Um, to be base, considered basic, you should probably be somewhere like about a 205, uh, maybe 207 is probably that cut line there if we look across there. I want you to look right here where New York was. Okay, now New York's NAEP score, I'm going to guess based on last year's state assessment, is going to be higher when we look at this, when they've calculated it and they figured that out. Um, this is something we need to start talking about because it's not necessarily that kids are doing worse than they did, it's they're me being measured in a different way. We need to up our rigor for that. And you can see if we had this as a 200, is that what we want? If we're talking about proficiency rate should be up at 238 or so, you can see there's actually almost no state minus Massachusetts that was even there. Interesting story on Massachusetts if you want to know. Massachusetts, five years previous to this, was down here at the 175. And those of you that have, have tracked it, and I'm sure you've heard a little bit about it, living on the East Coast, they raised their proficiency rates, they increased the rigor of their assessments, their kids fell way back. They were probably a little more prepared for what we're facing now as we move forward. But we need to keep increasing that, because once again, today's ceiling is tomorrow's floor. So let's talk about staff. I want you to just take a minute to self-reflect and ask yourself, how well do you think your staff would do in answering these questions about your school district or your school. Hopefully somewhere on the continuation of a 1 to 10. You're probably not a 1. You're probably not a 10. How can we get there? How do we start looking at this? You have to start getting this data into the hands of your teachers. You start, need to start looking at multiple ways to assess where you are. Um, and these shouldn't just be the state assessment results, honestly, guys. We should be looking at how many, what percentage of our kids are taking SATs. What are their scores on the SATs? I'll give you a crazy one. How can we figure out a way to track how our kids are doing when they go to college? Even if you can just keep track of the ones that are real close to you. Talk to your community colleges. Talk to your, you know, your state colleges. Try to figure out how those kids are doing. It would be very interesting data to know. And then if you fast forward in 10 years, how many of those kids are in jobs? We need to start looking at this. We need to start preparing for this and start thinking about it. Um, we talked about this in AIS. I think you've talked probably a lot about this in Creative Classroom. But when it comes down to it, we have two things that we really can't change much. One is the amount of time that kids have. We have 180 days of school. Probably not going to change that. I think if anybody went to their board tomorrow and said, what we really need is 220 days. They're probably going to look at you and say, yeah, how are we going to fund 220 days? You also have the standards. If your typical student, your on-pace student, is going to meet right here at this, where this box meets, 180 days, standards, here's where I am, what are we doing about our high and our low students? How are we getting them there? We have to get creative in our classrooms. Whatever that's going to be, your flip model, your blended learning model, your change in your AIS program, we have to change this. We have to get more time on task for some of our kids, and that maybe sometimes means being creative with things like, you know, we're going to have another period for some kids in math, and they're going to have to attend two periods of math. Talk about crazy. Schools never looked like that before. How do you work that out? Um, I, some of you, I, correct, imagine, can you imagine trying to change all the schedules in the school to match that? But how do we get there? How do we get there? Because the honest answer is we know this is what you're going to get. If you don't, you're going to have some kids here, and you're going to have some kids here. You're going to have some kids bored, and you're going to have some kids that never make the bar. Um, I want you to think about this, too. I don't think there's any such thing as a normal student. <laughs> um, if you think there are, I want you to ask yourselves, how many normal adults do you have in your school? <laughs> Um, and I won't ask you to think, rank them like from high to low, but everybody learns in a slightly different way. <laughs> if each one of these dots up here represents kids, different kids are going to need different things. And I'm going to even challenge that they don't just need different things, they need different things depending on what the subject and the content area is. 
So it's not even just that there's one type of learner. I learned very differently in math than I learned in English. I was always that type of learner. So just thinking about a continuum of some students don't need very much teacher support to get there. Some are going to need a lot. There's also different ways to get here. You could make this continuum different resource things. These are just four of them to think about. This is obviously just I need the teacher sitting with me in order to learn, and I'm going to have that teacher as my only resource in order to learn. This is I can, use, I can learn through peers, mentors. I learn better that way. Um, some people learn better through social media. We started to hear that. This group, this generation is wired differently than us. They do learn very well through Twitter and things like that when it's done the effective way. Um, and some of them learn very effectively from online content. So we really need to think about our kids and think about if there is no normal students, how do we have different paths for kids to get there? How do we provide opportunities for online? How do we provide opportunities for peer uh, mentoring inside of our schools in different areas? These were asked to um, business leaders across the country, and they were said, basically, what is it the kids need in order to be successful to work for your company? Okay? I want us to think about what do we do inside our school days that fosters this in our kids? Okay? Some of the things we heard about today, project-based learning, flipping, things like that, are some of the tools in order to get there. The last one I saved for last for a reason. <laughs> um, how many of you would find these in the Common Core Standards directly? You can find them in some ways, right, written throughout, the ability to synthesize, the ability to work with peers. You see it in there, but we really need to think about it systematically. It doesn't matter if it was Common Core adopted in New York or not. How are we going to get there? Because as Bob and I were talking, a lot of what's in the Common Core are the things we've been talking about as educators for years now that we know we need to do in schools. Project-based learning, a new thing. Is higher levels of EL, uh, literacy a new thing? How many of you have known that everybody should be a reading teacher for years and years and years now? A lot of what's in there is not new. It's just now it's almost like this enforced thing. So, you know, sometimes we, we want to get past even what needs to be enforced and go even to the next level. So, the tools that are needed. I really do believe this. First one, there's not going to be one path to get there. It's like there's not one normal student. There's not going to be one tool that's going to work. There's not going to be one size that fits all. It's about pulling all the data together into a place. It's about streamlining things for your teachers. It's about freeing them up to be able to think about how they're planning for their instruction, how they can get to those creative places. Um, you have to vary the techniques, the resources, and the timing. We talked about this in AIS. I know you talked about it in the creative classroom. You have to do those things in order to get there. This third one is kind of important. Um, it's the one that kind of sometimes gets, um, I don't want to use the word bastardized, but I'm going to use it anyway, bastardized a little bit, which is this whole notion of, um, I know the states release modules. I think that's great that there's curriculum out there. But I don't think you can ever say, if we use the modules, we're going to get where we need to go. The modules are a tool. They're a roadmap. They're a common pacing to get there. But I also have to use my data to make decisions about, OK, if this is coming up in the modules, but my kids are already showing proficiency on that, I get to use that time to target something they're not as good at now. And that's going to vary from year to year, from student to student, from class to class. And we have to have a continuous short-term planning with flexibility and adjustments. If we're not re-looking at it continuously and saying, OK, this is working really well. OK, we've got to change this now. Talk a lot about having a 20-day plan, a 30-day plan. These five-year plans for school improvement are a thing of the past. The world doesn't work that way. If you try to make a five-year plan for school improvement right now, there are things you don't even know that you might need in order to be effective that don't even exist for you to grab right now. This is really, um, how many of you have ever seen this before? The, uh, basically, this is the model of lesson quadrant learning. Have any of you ever seen uh, Bill Daggett present this before in the past? OK, so there's two things that come into play here. One is something that we're all pretty familiar with. Anybody know what these six things are here? Somebody yell it out, get a ticket. I think Kurt said it first, but Blooms, if we can get him a ticket there. So this is Blooms. OK, so obviously we got low-level Blooms to high-level Blooms, right? Going across the bottom is what we call the knowledge taxonomy. The knowledge taxonomy basically looks at if I have, discipline, if I have to learn something and it's in one discipline only, and it's very much teacher-led, I'm probably right here, low level, 
right here, quadrant A. If I'm applying it in one discipline, so if I'm that chemistry teacher and I'm just applying it to chemistry like we heard him talk about this morning in flipped classroom, and the teacher's doing the lecturing, I'm down here. I might be up here if it's going to require a high level of thinking, like those AP things we were talking about today. This is where you'll see a lot of your AP classes are up here in quadrant C. High level of student thinking because they're at analyzing, evaluating, and creating over here. But to get to quadrant D, where the student is thinking and working, we really have to be applying it across multiple disciplines. And our ultimate goal would be to get it in unpredictable world situations. Well, how do you get to an unpredictable world situation, Emily? Well, the honest answer is it can't be just a teacher lesson plan up in the front of the room. It's going to be student-led. It's going to be that collaborative, here's a problem, now figure out how we can solve it. And there may be a hundred different paths in order to get there. But the bottom line with this is we can't spend all of our time up here. What do you think is going to happen if we spend all of our time up here in quadrant D? Kids are never going to get the base that they need, right? So I want to challenge you to think about how are your teachers hitting in all of these different quadrants? How are we attacking? This is like our teacher lecture model. If we think about this, this is usually our CTE classes where the kids are doing a lot of doing, maybe at low level of thinking. This is typically where we've seen our AP courses and college prep classes. And this over here is what we've considered that project-based learning. We have to incorporate all of these in here, but the goal is to have those experiences in D. And once again, that is kind of the message of what the Common Core tries to get to. Did an analysis. This was just me on my own spare time. I was just curious. <laughs> And I took the fourth grade, this is the kind of uh, cr crazy brain I have. I stayed up one night and I said, I just wonder if I took all of the standards from New York old standards and I said, I'm going to rank them high or low. They're going to be high if they're on the top three levels of blooms. They're going to be low if they're on the bottom three levels of blooms. Did that with the old New York math standards. This is just a fourth grade sample. 64% of the standards were in the bottom three levels of blooms. 26% of them were in the high levels of blooms. Some news, right? At least there's some high ones in there. There were 56 total standards in New York, and I did not include the process standards in that. Let's look at math new, Common Core. Did the same thing, went through the same thing with Common Core, just said, I'm going to rank them high and low. We got 25% of them were in the low level of blooms, and 75% of them were in the high level of blooms. Now, going back to the quadrants, remember, we don't want to just penalize our teachers just because they're in quadrant A because some quadrant A is going to be needed to build them to that. But are we getting there? Are we getting there that high of a period of time? Look at reading. I actually thought when I did this, I was curious about math and I did the math and I thought, I don't think reading is going to be as different really. Um, I was kind of surprised. I don't know if you guys were shocked by this or not, but 67% of the standards in New York before on reading were at the low and 33% were at the high. This is just reading standards, I did not incorporate writing, just to be fair. Um, and I didn't do that with uh, Common Core either. And there were 67 of them. I was actually shocked. <laughs> I had forgotten because we did curriculum for fourth grade New York standards before. I was kind of shocked when I was going back through them, remembering some of the things were in there, like write a personal reading list. Um, and then look at the new standards. This is Common Core new, 91% high, nine, I mean, sorry. I, you know what, that is absolutely wrong up there. I totally flipped that, so I apologize. You're probably like, what, Emily, is going on? I totally flipped that and didn't realize that until just now. 91% of them were high and 9% were low. Um, and that's a total of 23 standards. So how do we get to rigor? Because I'm going to be honest with you, I have talked to so many groups of teachers after they've taken benchmark assessments or data inquiry teams, and the thing I hear a lot is, Emily, I understand, but our kids are really low. I don't think they can do this. I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to kid you. I've actually sat in front of a staff and actually had the principal afterwards come up to me and say, "This is great stuff, but I don't think our kids can." I'm going to talk about that when we come to student messages in a minute. But I want you to think about this: the key to getting there is relevance. If you can make the learning relevant, think about the creative classroom solutions. You can get to the rigor. That is the key. What was everything he was talking about this morning with our flipped classroom? Where was it? all the stories he highlighted were the stories of when the kids got hooked into the learning because they had the buy-in because they saw, I get to run this. I get to see this. This connects to my life. 
And there's really two paths to get there. Um, compare your learning to, and you can basically say, you know, if you've got kids that are super interested in a particular career path, that's obviously a great way to get them connected to, I know you want to be a chemist when you grow up. Think about how this is going to relate to that. Now, you're not always going to have those examples. You can also relate it to everything down to students' life. Having those conversations with kids about the jobs that are out there, do you think that's not critical for our science and math teachers to do? Absolutely. Real world tools are the other one to get there. A lot of times when we talk about relevancy, people stop and they think about this, and they don't necessarily think about this piece. Once again, the tools we've been talking about today are hopefully some of the tools you can start to use and think about as you're getting to this path of using, getting to relevant learning. But if you don't have the relevancy, you will not get to the rigor level. So let's talk about the assessments, because if you're talking to your staff, you know it's going to come up. Yes, but how do I get better at the test results? How do I get there, and how do I get there fast? The first thing we've got to do, and you, you're, you want to get your staff as hungry as possible. If you share two or three examples at every staff meeting, I would say that's a great way to start a staff meeting. Backwards design. Let's talk about what does this look like? What does it look like on the assessment? And I'm going to even challenge you further. What would this look like in the real world if I was applying it as an adult? Once we get there, we can figure out how to plan to get to that end goal with steps along the way. Um, you know, what's coming down the pipe for educators is another thing. We are always, you know, there's always this cyclical thing that goes on with change. Assessment is actually the one where we're starting to see some new groundwork being made, which is, uh, you know, for a long time, when I was in school in the 70s, it was all about the bell curve. I can remember my high school teacher, he was so excited because he had the most perfect bell curve and he would come in and tell us after a test I designed the best test because look you know right here in the middle almost 50 percent of you you're right at this you know right at this range here and we have just a few kids that got an A we moved away from that in the last few years as you all know it's not about winners and losers it's all about everybody progressing to the right so we moved to standards based one-to-one -one assessments and that's what our current state assessment model is on even with the common core right now it's still a here's a question this is the standard it's assessing this is really what we're talking to moving to. And if you ask teachers two years ago, what was your number one complaint about the state task, what would they tell you? I bet they would tell you, well, yeah, that's great, but that's not, even what, that's, so, that's not what we want our kids to be good at. We want our kids to be better at that. I do great things with essays and DBQs and things in my classroom, so that test result is just one thing. We're heading in that direction. What does that mean, though? Because the honest answer is, as we move to it, it's going to get more and more uncomfortable for people. Because we're going to start looking at, I have a problem that's assessing five different things at one time. That means my kids have to be good at all five of those things to get anywhere near able to accomplish this goal. Um, really quickly, as you probably all know, if PARC comes down the line, if PARC doesn't come down the line, I think with the technology being out there and what it is, these are the three things we're looking at. Um, Assessment-wise, evidence-based, this is multiple choice. The bottom line is it's multiple choice questions. What's interesting in the conversation to start having with your staff is it's not a traditional multiple choice question anymore. It's a lot more eliminating scenario type questions out of multiple choice. It's no longer, we did great examples in last year's presentation of, you know, we used to just say calculate the mean and then you'd have four numbers and they'd pick the mean. Now it's look at this and say which of these would be the best calculation if you want to look at these two graphs to find out, you know, what is the likelihood of the soccer team scoring 65 points next week. Technology enhanced, it's really going to come down to those drag and drop scenarios and things like that where technology is starting to get a little bit smarter and able to start doing some of those grading practices where traditionally in the past we haven't been able to. It's also where you start to look at scenarios where you can have multiple um, answers that you have to select in order to be completely correct. And if you only collect, select part of them, you're not going to get all the points possible. Um, those types of things. And then the last one is really not a big change for New York. It is a change for other states which is basically those extended response, those, sh those part twos that we've had here in New York for a while. But I think the rigor level of what you're talking about on those part twos is now going to be cross-discipline, and it's going to look a little bit different. Um, for the sake of time, we're probably not going to do this one, but I w this PowerPoint will be available, and I would, I would challenge you to use this at one of your um, staff meetings. This is a park assessment question that was for sixth grade. And I think we'd all agree this is a real world scenario. How, have you, how many of you know the two second rule? How many of you were asked to calculate 
what you should do to get the two second rule. This is what this question is all about. It's basically saying we have these two cars, they're traveling at this speed. How many feet would it be um, to get the two second rule at this speed? And if they both increase to this speed, what would it be? Um, I challenge you to kind of try to solve that problem in your mind. So how are we going to get there as a staff? Well, we're going to have to talk about our plans and look at schedules, materials, interventions, and alternative strategies in order to get there. If we do what we did before, just like he said this morning, if we do what we've always done, we're going to get the same result we've, already got, we've always gotten. We have to change it up. Um, inside this PowerPoint, and once again, you know, it'll be available, but these are three, you know, three to four um, resources maybe to utilize with your staff. The first one is just a great paper um, on fulfilling the promises of Common Core. It really doesn't talk about Common Core as much as it talks about CACD um, white paper. Many of you may have already read it. It just talks about why are we there. It gives them a little more background than what the PowerPoint slides did. Um, the other two are just practice exams, and once again, just another way to start thinking about that backwards design model. And the last one, are, these are two states that are not New York, but I would just highly recommend them. The first one is a K2, it has great K2 um, exemplars, and the second one is really great K12, Read Tennessee. Um, there's just some really great materials on there. Once again, Engage New York is great, but let's not just think about that as our only tool and resource. There's so many out there to look at. So, we've talked to our staff, we've talked to our board, we've got them on our side. Let's talk about parents in the community. I said it before with the board, it's even more important with the parents. The parents care about their kids. It's the honest answer. You have to make this personal for them. You have to make progress um, and growth part of the communication. Um, I have seen this before, and I've seen it time and time again, and I'm sure you all have as well. When you have that parent that comes in, that they're very concerned about the level that their student is, and they want to know what is your plan to get them there. Well, we've got to talk about progress and growth. We're going to be meeting with your child. We're going to be setting goals. We're going to talk about all that in a second. But how are they progressing? How are they on that trajectory line? If we had all of our school improvement there, we want to see them above that trajectory line. How are we going to get them there? Display and share goals. I'm a huge proponent of sharing group goals with parents. At any chance you can do it, whether it's, you know, the honor roll assembly where parents come in, whether it's through your newsletter, whatever it's going to be, Use your assessment, the things that you're assessing, and communicate your goals to parents. We do a lot of creative things with the benchmark assessments. This is just one example of ways you could do this, where we track the number of correct questions. Third grade got together as a group at the beginning. Okay, what's our goal for the next point? Let's, let's, and let's promote that with our parents. Let's talk about it. You'd be surprised at how much buy-in um, you get not only from the kids, but also from the parents, because they see you're focused on improving. That's all that matters. We're improving on this continuum. All these things we're working on, we're going to get there. And give them multiple avenues for feedback and opportunities. It's the 21st century. Um, not all of our parents um, are able to come in to school in the traditional way. How can we get there in different ways? Think about that. Think about your community. Think about the resources they have. Think about the availability um, of what you could provide or offer to them that will pull them into your community so you can start having these conversations because it's key to getting to where we want to be. This is an example of one of those goal charts I was just talking about with the number of quick questions. And you can see these kids that actually set a goal for middle of the year, and then now they have their end of year goal. And this was just displayed school-wide. And all the kids knew it. And they were all working on it together. And if every kid got one more question correct, they used to be able to tell me. When you're walking around the building, they used to be able to say, this is Dean, if we all get five more questions correct next time, then we're going to make our goal. It's a great feeling. It's a great way to build that community. Which brings us to our students. Once again, have to personalize this for them. Kids do not want to just do what you do because you're the adult standing in the front of the room. If you think that that's the case, you're probably not right. Especially how many of you have ever experienced middle school kids or high school kids? You know, I mean, let's all be honest. They start out in kindergarten, what do they come in? They love their teacher no matter what, right? Sometimes you're, I've been in schools where I thought, looked at that kindergarten teacher and I thought, wow, I wouldn't want to have her for a teacher or him for a teacher. But those kids are just following along with her. It's just like, this is great. This is my teacher. Everything's good. You have to make this personalized. You have to explain to kids, we're learning this today because this is something you need to work on. The power of individualized learning. Make it relevant. We spent a lot of time talking about that. I want to really think about these statements. Two of my biggest pet peeves. These students. Anytime you start out, these students can't. 
these students this, these students that. There is no normal student. Every kid needs an individual plan. It's not these students. And I, once again, we all know this. It's all about expectation levels, setting them high, and not allowing kids to say, I can't. I'm not good at math. I can't do that. No, right now you're not good at fractions. Let's talk about how we're going to get better at that. And setting goals. Meeting with kids individually to talk to them about what their weekend. And that takes creative planning. It does not come easy. If you think it's easy, it's just not going to be easy if you've never done it before. Once it's, an, once it's set in your culture and it's something you do, it becomes so embedded and it becomes such a powerful tool. But you have to find ways to get there. And then here's the last one. Get honest feedback from all types of students. We so often hear about how we're doing in schools from the kids who are doing well. Those are the kids that are in student council. Those are the kids that are coming into your office. Those are the kids that talk to you at bus stop off. Those are the kids that you hear from. What about the kids that aren't doing well? How are you reaching out as an organization, as a system, to talk to them to find out why? And it's just a continuous process. Just like everything else, it's a continuous process of asking for the feedback, analyzing the feedback, trying to come up, a reflect, to come up with a plan, act on it. Um, I talked about in the AIS breakout, it's not about best practice, it's about next practice. Okay? All the best practices out there is great, but you've got to take a step on that continuum towards your next practice in order to get to your ultimate goal. You have to take those steps. So it's a continual process of asking, analyzing, planning, and acting on it. And I'm going to say that when you're having conversations with your board, when you're having conversations with your staff, when you're having conversations with your kids, when you're having conversations with your parents, and whether it's your teachers talking to your kids, there is one aspect that is the most critical of all, and that is trust. They need to trust you in order to be collaborative. The kids need to trust the teacher. How many of you know the kids that trust the teacher and the kids that don't? I mean, if we think about this morning and the presentation we have, half of what we've, he's got going on is, do you think his kids really believe that he wants them to succeed? I think the answer is yes. I've never been in Mark's classroom before in my life. But I would just guess based on the way he talks and what he says, those kids are going to trust him. So we have to build that trust. I want to show you um, kind of a humorous clip here as um, we head into closing out for this, this part today. A humorous clip of what happens when we don't have trust versus when we do. If you've seen this before, don't uh, ruin it for anybody. Else. Oh, wow. Yeah. Nice and easy. We'll just head on out and whenever you're ready. Are you ready to go ahead and, yeah. and drive? Okay, yeah, sure. Oh, whoa. <laughs> that's all right. Oh, a little more than I'm used to. Yeah. Oh, it's got some power, so just get a feel for it. Okay. Okay, all right. But ease off just a little bit. Ease off. So I was thinking. A little more age on me, some wrinkles, a little dorky, maybe some facial hair. And somebody that I can pull off a, a fun prank with. <laughs> Let's go have some fun. My good friends at Pepsi Max have hooked us up with this cool can cam. So these are the glasses cam to show you everything that I see. How you doing? Hello. I'm Mike. Steve, nice to meet you, Mike. I saw you sort of gravitated towards the Camaro. Are you thinking about getting one? Oh, no, no, no. This is way too much car for me. I'm Well, it's a lot of power, but they designed it to be very safe. I don't know if I can handle it. I, I've never driven anything like this before. Well, I, I tell you what, I think a way to really make you feel comfortable would be to put you behind the wheel. You're good. <laughs> what are you driving now? Oh, just a minivan. Oh, yeah. Yeah, what am I not signing obligated. here? You not, sure? it's, it's just a checkout sheet for a test drive. You're not obligated to anything. It's just so we know who's out. Let's go give it a drive. Are I'm getting a little nervous. No, I'll be right there beside you. There are your keys, sir. Thank you, Steve. But you'll have to unlock it, Mike. Oh, yeah. thank you. There we go. Oh, yeah. What a car. Mm -hmm. Well, we better buckle up. Yeah, good call. Power. Power door locks. Standard, of course. You are liable for any damages to the vehicle, so please stop the car. Slow, or at least slow down. Slow down. Slow down. 
You can't go through that gate, Mike. this card. You're liable for it if you wreck it. Mike, stop the car. Stop the car right now. Stop here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Take us back. Just take us back. Oh, God. No, no, you don't understand. It's not what you think. It's not what you think. No, it's just a prank. We're just having fun. Look, this is a camera. Here's a camera. There's cameras. Look, it was all just fun. Look, I'm Jeff Gordon. Sorry, man. Sorry. Can we do it again? Yeah, let's do it again. So I want you to notice what happened there. You took somebody who was completely freaked out for their life, and as soon as this guy says, I'm Jeff Gordon, he goes, what do you say? You want to go do it again? <laughs> Trust is the key. You have to build it. And when people know that you mean it when you say it to them, they're going to feel it, and they're going to know you're behind them. And I know with APPR, which we're going to talk about in a second, and all that other wonderful stuff going on there, it's really hard to get there. But we have to build that trust with all of our constituency groups. It takes an agile leader to do that. It takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of dedication. And it takes getting out there with the message. But I think it's imperative for us to be able to do it in order to meet the expectations of Common Core, but really the world that our kids are facing. So thank you for the, taking the time to listen today. I hope it was meaningful for you.